Well, today we'll start with patience. Patience in general is a virtue whereby we bear without anger adversity. The opposite of patience is anger. Anger wants to throw off adversity. Patience bears it. Right, so sometimes anger is necessary. Sometimes it's a virtue. Sometimes it would be wrong not to have anger over certain things. But usually our anger is excessive and uh, very often it is about objects which do not deserve anger. In other words, misplaced. Things that are not truly evil. Those are the two ways of sinning by anger, either by excess or by becoming angry over something that is undue. So patience is a great virtue. St. Cyprian said, the first thing we do on entering the world is to cry and weep. Although we know nothing else, we know how to shed tears. This general instinct intimates that we then commence our voyage over a sea of miseries. See, the theology of patience, you might say, is this, that the redemption did not restore the terrestrial paradise. It restored the rectification of man's soul, which is the source of future paradise. So internal grace, sanctifying grace, and everything that goes with sanctifying grace is the effect of the redemption. Actual graces that urge us toward acts of virtue. All of those things are part of what we call the grace of Christ. But it did not restore the terrestrial paradise. The original plan was that there be no misery, but that man would merit his salvation by means of the enjoyment of the things which God created for him. So merit through enjoyment. Monsignor de la Sousse, in his great work, The Anti-Christian Conspiracy, in summing up the modern world, he said the, the, uh, the motto, if you want, of, of the anti-Christian modern world is enjoy. Whereas the single word that pertains to the Christian life is merit. And these are this, those two things divide humanity. It used to be that you merited by enjoyment. But now you merit by the cross. You merit by bearing the punishments for original sin that still remain. And these sufferings are elevated and sanctified by the cross of Christ. So by imitation of the cross of Christ, we merit our salvation. 
as I have said many times, we are not Protestants who say that like a bridge toll, the toll is paid, we're off the hook, we don't have to worry anymore, the price has been paid by Christ and now we don't have to do penance. We don't have to be crucified with Christ. He did it. We're done. That's the Protestant mentality. So the pursuit of worldly goods is very much a part of Protestantism. They have no idea of penance. Penance for them is something useless because it, we're all sinners anyway. We're just let off the hook. We, we, are, we are no longer re, uh, responsible for making payment. That's the Protestant mentality. That is not the Catholic doctrine. The Catholic doctrine is that the church is the mystical body of Christ and that just as the physical body of Christ is crucified, so the mystical body of Christ must also be crucified. And that in crucifying oneself, that is in the patient bearing of the crosses of this life, we sanctify our souls. That's why you have fast days. That's why you have monastic life. That's why you have mortification, and perfect chastity, and all of the other things. So there's a, a difference of night and day between Protestant and Catholic. Night and day. So the Catholic is always looking upwards. He's, he's, his, his whole civilization is supernatural. Whereas the Protestant has a very natural civilization. And you see that in Protestant countries, you know, after the Reformation, there's very little that is uplifting in those countries from the point of view of art and architecture. Very little. Whereas Catholic art and architecture is always uplifting and, and uh, it's what keeps the airlines in business. It's true. What is there to see in Europe except the remnants of Catholic culture? It's the only thing to see. <laughs> see, so the the um, that that's fundamental in understanding. Catholic spirituality is the, the bearing of the cross in union with the crucified Savior. That's why the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is the center of our religion. That's why you see everywhere Christ crucified, not merely a cross as the Protestants have to remind us of you know, one day 2,000 years ago Christ died, but you have constantly the cross in front of you, crucified. St. Paul said, I preach Christ and Christ crucified. So that brings us back to patience. Because man has sinned, the, the whole economy of salvation therefore changes from enjoyment to one of merit through suffering. And this is so first because God has inflicted punishment upon man owing to his sins. It's in Genesis. He enlisted the earth in the punishment of man. He inflicted death, which involves disease and old age, upon man. Those things have not been lifted. The second reason is that there is a disorder in man inclining him to sin, thereby creating suffering both for himself and for others. 
most of the suffering in this life comes from your own moral and spiritual disorders or from those of others. Most of it. Yes, there is disease, there is death. But imagine what the world would be like if everyone obeyed the commandments. Every single person obeyed the commandments. It would be a, a kind of paradise. Most of our problems come from the disorders of ourselves or other people. Many times our physical problems come from our own disorders or the disorders of others. Mental problems, people raised in families that are very, very disordered, often end up with mental problems, all kinds of complexes, etc. Through no fault of their own. St. Alphonsus said, we cannot be perfectly happy except in heaven, our homeland, and our eternal repose. We spend a very short time in this world, and this very little time is filled with miseries. No one is altogether exempt from suffering. All men, whether just or sinners, are obliged to carry the cross. He who bears it willingly and patiently is saved. He who carries it with impatience is lost. So that's simple. There is a constant quest in human beings to retrieve the earthly paradise. It's the whole idea of socialism. Make the world a better place to live. It will never happen. But that's their religion. Making the world a better place to live. The quest for earthly paradise. The quest for money and all sorts of pleasures. It's all that quest for earthly paradise. St. Augustine said, the very same miseries are means of salvation to some, whilst they are the cause of damnation to others. It is in the sieve of affliction that the good grain is separated from the bad in the church of God. He who humbles himself in tribulations and is resigned to God's will is the good grain which is destined to heaven. He, on the contrary, who is proud and impatient and abandons God, is destined for hell. He also said, as children grow up and begin to serve God, error tempts them to turn aside. Labor and sorrow tempt them to discouragement. Concupiscence tempts them to lust. Pride tempts them to exalt themselves. And who can find words to represent all the curious miseries which afflict the children of Adam? So nothing has changed from the fourth century. He also said, St. Augustine, the longer we live, the longer our torture. So we must conclude that for as long as we are in this world, we will never be entirely free from suffering. There is always something to suffer. The present economy of salvation is one of suffering 
that is, through the patient bearing of our daily crosses, we merit eternal salvation, as I said in the beginning. St. Vincent Ferrer said, Our Lord sends us tribulations that we may have means to pay the immense debt we have contracted against him. Wherefore, they who are wise receive tribulations with joy because they consider more the advantages which they derive from them than the pain that they suffer. St. Ignatius complained that God must not be pleased with his order because things were going too well. That there were no difficulties and problems and tribulations. He was worried. That's the wisdom of the saints. They understand this very, very deeply. Those who love the world consider themselves happy and successful when they peaceably enjoy everything they want. Conversely, they complain about God when anything goes wrong. That's very typical. Why does God permit this? Or why doesn't he fix that? They consider them as signs of God's anger. They ask how God in his wisdom could permit suffering in the world. That's a constant question from atheists and worldlings. I would believe in God, except, you know, you see all this suffering. They cannot understand how the good suffer and the wicked are left to their pleasures and are at least apparently triumphant. St. Thomas Aquinas said that the book of Job was written in order to teach us why the good suffer. He commented that book. However, if these people understood the true religion, they would see in these trials both God's mercy and justice. These trials, afflictions, whatever should beset us, are often the signs of God's favor and pledges of love and everlasting happiness. They are also a merciful act of providence whereby our faults and sins are both corrected and expiated or in the case of a just man, his virtues are perfected. So it's related to what we were saying about temptation, that there is an exercise of virtue when there is an affliction, and uh, one, of, uh, one of the afflictions is temptation. But there could be other afflictions, uh, suffering, and all kinds of, of terrible things that happen to us, injustice. And it's a way of expiating sin. Don't forget there's temporal punishment due to sin. That when you commit a sin, there's not only the culpa, that is the fault, but there is also the damage. It's something like throwing a rock through your neighbor's window. Right? You go to your neighbor and say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I threw a rock through your window. And your neighbor, if he's nice, will say, that's okay, but you still have to pay for the window. The same is true. You detract from the glory of God when you sin. It's a damage. That's the, the notion of, of temporal punishment due to sin. And that must be overcome in this life by fervent acts of prayer, uh, fervent reception of Holy Communion, for example, um, and acts of sacrifice, acts of penance, patience, good works in general. 
indulgences. For every sin committed in this life, man must be punished either in this life or in the next. Either by voluntary penance or by the rightful and just vengeance of God. It has to happen by the justice of God. St. Odo said, Adam once sinned and is dead. If you therefore should sin, expect not to be spared. If anyone could have been spared, it would have been Adam, who was newly made, tender and rude, and who had no knowledge of sin before. But as for you who love sin after the law, after the prophets, after the gospel, after the apostles, what hope can there be of indulgence? And there he's not referring to ecclesiastical indulgences. He means of, of uh, looking the other way. All right, let's stop.